Good afternoon, everyone. I cordially welcome you for the 12th lecture of the short course on cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology 2022-2023. Today, we are focusing on India's role in the Asian community. The program for today is such that the lecture is scheduled to be for 75 minutes with a short break of five minutes followed by a question and answer session. May I now have the honor of introducing our guest lecturer, Professor Rahul Raj, a lecturer at the Center of, for Korean Studies for School, Lang for School of Language, Literature, Cultural Studies at the prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru University in India. Our stream guest received his Bachelor of Arts, Master of Arts and Master of Philosophy in Korean Studies from Jawaharlal Nehru University and completed his PhD in Korean Studies at Hanyan University, Seoul, South Korea. Professor Raj has been awarded numerous awards and scholarships, and few of it are the Korean Government Scholarships, Outstanding Scholar Award by the Minister of Education, Science and Technology, Government of Republic of Korea, and Distinguished Scholar Award for the Outstanding Performance in the Y20 Summit, Y20 on the Lives of G20. Professor Raj has contributed greatly to the field of peace and conflict studies by conducting various research such as North Korea, North Korea time to focus on minimization or denuclearization, South Korea, the two moons and the future of a nation, and terminal high altitude area defense of South Korea, US China dynamics. Moreover, he has contributed his boundless knowledge in opinion editorial articles such as Could Ban Ki Moon Repeat Kim Dae Jun? Korea ODA to India and South Korea India versus North Korea Pakistan. Sir, we are deeply honored to have you with us here, and now we are warmly welcome to deliver you to this lecture. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Hemanta, uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to deliver a lecture again uh, at your uh, prestigious uh, university in Sri Lanka. Uh, and I have a, uh, good memories of um, uh, Sri Lankan visit a few years ago. And it's still uh, a lot of good friends from Sri Lanka. So you are one of them. So thank you once again. And thank you for uh, introducing me. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to talk about India's role in Asian community. So uh, in the sense that what is, uh, how India is uh, shaping its foreign policy uh, towards its neighbors and towards uh, uh, neighbors which are a little bit far, but still inside India considered as, as close as any uh, closer neighbors. Okay. So as she has already introduced um, uh, me, uh, so nothing to say more about that. Presently, I'm doing, uh, teaching as assistant professor in Co Center for Korean Studies at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. And before that, I worked, <coughs> I worked at uh, uh, some Korean universities such as Sejong University at, uh, as well as Hanyang University. And, uh, um, and also uh, presently I'm holding a position in the board of directors at Korea Institute of International Studies. Now, uh, moving to uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, my topic. So Asia is, uh, if we, you see uh, uh, different continents around the world, Asia is the only region you'll find that with so much diversity, ranging from religion, uh, race, ethnicity, language to home for different ideologies, as well as different forms of government. Even if you go to Europe or you go to uh, 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 North America or South America, you'll find uh, similarities in the language or in, in, even in the culture. Uh, but when it comes to uh, Asia, it's completely different. For example, what uh, we have different languages, people say Arabic language in the Middle, uh, Middle East, the Middle East perspective is from uh, United States, but from Asian perspective, it is West Asia. So if you see uh, Saudi Arabia or Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia or, or uh, other countries uh, like Kuwait, Oman, but uh, it's probably the same language, but 
just a little bit far, uh, not little bit, uh, uh, you go uh, and then you will see Iran, a different language and it has its own great civilization, uh, Persia. And then uh, you move towards India, you will find a uh, it's already a very diverse country. And then again, move to other countries like East Asia or Southeast Asia. So, so you'll find the variance in languages, variance in culture also. From, a, uh, from uh, Islamic culture to uh, to, uh, to Buddhist culture uh, to uh, to Hindu culture, so many other things, language, religion, so so many variants are, are there. So Asia, you'll find that, and also political ideology, you'll find uh, there is a presidential form of government, there is a uh, 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 cabinet uh, prime minister form of government, and uh, there is also dictatorship. Like uh, you'll find uh, there's a military dictatorship also like Myanmar. There is also uh, communist ideology, like uh, you can say Vietnam or China. So Asia is the only region where you find so much variance. Hmm? The significance, even if you see, we see Asian regional cooperation lies in the fact that it represents an effort to develop Asian solutions to Asian problems in a cooperative uh, arrangement. So people say Asia has this problem or Asia, but not necessary. The Western society, they have solved this problem. So uh, 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 that, uh, that solution may be applicable uh, in Asia because it has so much difference. That's what uh, uh, Lee Kuan, the, the father of modern Singapore, he said that um, Asia can solve its own problem in Asian way. As a means, it is a strategy to raise regional collective economic issues uh, status of these countries from one uh, um, uh, dependence on of, of the developed world to that of being equal partners with it, thereby enabling the developing countries to demonstrate their power. Okay, so most of the Asian countries you'll find not all, but most of the a Asian countries were the victim of colonialism. So it, the kind of grudge is also there, grievances is also there. And it has its own problem. Some countries have political problems, some countries have poverty problems, some countries have economic problem. And in the form of uh, so, uh, uh, what the Western society says that this, uh, this style of government, the that style of government, probably it may not work because we want to find Asian way, not the Western way. Okay. Uh, it is often said that. Uh, it, that uh, the present century, 21st century, would be an Asian century. As no doubt that Asian countries have become the growth of global economy. You'll find that Asian countries are rising in spite of different uh, um, uh, uh, problem, uh, difficulties, whether, whether it is political or it, um, the economic or so many other things, territorial disputes. Still, countries are rising. Even if you see a small country, Bangladesh is also rising. Like Bang Bangladesh, you'll find that it has become the hub of Textile industries, more, more uh, of foreign textile, uh, uh, foreign companies like Zara, H and M, all are going to uh, Bangladesh. So Bangladesh, you'll find uh, just a very nascent country. 1971, it got the independence, and how it has um, uh, uh, achieved that position. Okay. India, of course, it's a big country. Uh, if we see in the South Asia, uh, uh, South, uh, uh, South in South Asia, it's the. Uh, it's, it is often called a subcontinent, Indian subcontinent, and in that India is a very big country and a major player, very important in Asia with its size, potential, as well as historical and cultural linkages with almost all countries of Asia. If you see, when we see, uh, say India, okay, India, Buddhism may be called of that Sri Lanka or Nepal and all these countries. No, India also had civilizational relation with uh, uh, Iran also, Persian. India also have a, a good relations with because of the whatever maybe in India in the history Islamic um, invasion, but like they have also settled there, so India also connects with that culture religion, and then of course Buddhism, for sure it has helped a lot in India uh, historically it was connected and it helps in in the uh, present time uh, 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 for India to connect through this linkage. Okay. Historical uh, linkages, if you see religious linkage, for example, India is the birthplace of several religions, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Jainism, etc. So it's it's a, it's the mother of uh, 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 mother of many languages. 
Okay, so there's so languages as as well as religions. Of all the religions which originated or nurtured in India, Buddhism became the central pillar with its linkages with several Asian countries. So uh, not only in Sri Lanka or or, or Nepal, uh, but also in Myanmar. Even though uh, it, we have different uh, uh, form of government, uh, Myanmar there, there is like a, a military dictatorship. But still, when it comes to uh, connecting, at least we are connected with this uh, uh, common religion. Okay, in Vietnam also it has a communist form of government. In East Asia, highly capitalist like Japan and Korea, but again it is connected by one culture. culture. Although Islam didn't originate in India, India has its second big, largest popul Muslim population in the world, connecting fine tuning with the Middle East. So even the religions which were not, uh, which, uh, which were not actually uh, taken birth in India or uh, indigenous, they have almost become uh, uh, assimilated in India, so Indian society. So it also helps India to connect with a Middle East or West Asia. Civilizational relation, when we say, India shares common civilization with its neighbors as well as countries which are not bothered, such as Iran or Korea or even Japan. Even uh, for example, when I visited Sri Lanka, a lot of commonalities are there. So take for example, Sri Lankan women, I'm not saying all, many Sri Lankan women, they wear sari, Indian women wear sari. When I came uh, about the food, it's very common uh, uh, food culture. Language, of course, India has its own variants, so we cannot say Indian language or uh, uh, similar to Sri Lankan. It's a Sinhali, but leave aside the language, so much similarities are there to connect. And so uh, people generally think of that, oh, Buddhism. No, apart from Buddhism, the food, the dressing style, even the people behavior, it's very, very connect, connected. So, in fact, uh, just one experience, when I was in, uh, uh, in Korea uh, during my uh, studies, one of my best friend was from, uh, from, uh, from Sri Lanka. And often we used to have, the, uh, uh, we used to uh, cook food together and have the food. So, that kind of like network, it's just like you find that when, when we used to find uh, some Europeans like from Poland or, uh, or, or Germany, they used to get connected. We in uh, here in Asia, we quickly get connected. And then one of my Bangladeshi friends uh, also, also joined. So it's a kind of like Asian group uh, friendship was there. It, it doesn't mean that I, we were uh, trying to segregate. We didn't want to uh, mingle with the Europeans or the Westerns. It was not like that, but we found that some commonalities uh, in our in our behavior in our culture that's that swiftly we connect we get connected okay uh, in, uh, and of course now it's i'm saying about this uh, neighboring countries like nepal or bangladesh or sri lanka but uh, even the west uh, east asian countries like korea or japan koreans often like yes buddhism that's one factor at least uh, it, it get connected or even Japan, the same thing. So many countries, lang then comes the language. Many countries language has its roots in indo aryan language and many trace it to Sanskrit, the oldest written language in the world. So many, even uh, for example, Indonesia, if you see the of official, the airline of uh, uh, Indonesia, Garuda. So again, the Sanskrit word. So it's, it's so many communities you'll find it. Even if you go to uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur, so uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, religious places, very much, uh, it's a Muslim country, but again, it is it's still very much connected with India, when it comes to culture, religion. And Sri Lanka, many Indians want to go to uh, Sri Lanka to see where, uh, where uh, uh, especially uh, after listening this uh, Rama, Ramayana. So people have this uh, kind of, um, in, in Asia, uh, and also in, in India, I'm saying, uh, from Indian perspective, they want to connect, uh, they try to find out the commonalities between uh, these uh, uh, different cultures. I, I'm not saying common, but uh, different in the sense in Asia, but very much common. And we want uh, to have some linkages. Okay. Now, if you see, these are all historical, uh, we can say, generally, uh, but uh, in, in international relations, we often measure the relationship in intangible and tangible uh, uh, elements. So now we will see 
how India over the years, especially post independence, ha has changed. During the Cold War years, immediately after the in, in India and Sri Lanka and uh, so many other neighboring countries, they got independence almost at the same time after the uh, end of World War II. And, uh, and then uh, immediately then Cold War started between Soviet Union and, and United States. Uh, two blocks were divided, like uh, this block, Soviet Union and the communist bloc and the other uh, capitalist or democracy uh, Western uh, led by the United States. So during Cold Wars, India's international relations swung between idealist position, often associated with country's first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, and harder pragmatic realism favored by Indira Gandhi. Okay, because uh, India's uh, freedom fighters, uh, mostly Mahatma Gandhi or uh, Nehru, they were very much uh, idealist. Unfortunately, they realized that the world politics doesn't run on idealism. Okay, and that was realized when uh, Indira Gandhi became the prime minister. Above all, in, in India's international uh, profile was identified with non-aligned in Cold War uh, and solidarity with, uh, with the still colonized or newly developed, uh, decolonized countries, and more broadly with uh, the plight of developing countries. For example, um, India uh, 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 opted for uh, not joining any bloc, either Soviet uh, communist bloc or the West, uh, Western capitalist uh, democratic bloc. India realized that we are nascent newly born countries. We are in, in newly born countries and we just got independence. We have a lot of problem. We have to solve our own problem. Then we will think about the others. So if we get entangled with this block or that block, then there will be a problem. We cannot afford a war. So we, we have less resources. So India with like-minded countries and mostly they were the newly independent countries from Asia and Africa and they joined this non aligned movement okay and and uh, yeah and we had the common problems we had the common uh, issues that uh, we don't want to be uh, bullied by the uh, developed western world in the west india was often described as too much moralistic and uh, hypocritical because some of the things because we, uh, we, uh, we didn't join uh, india didn't join uh, this a uh, 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 us block and that's why people were very much wary although india was very much influenced by the british uh, uh, because of this 200 years of british rule but still when it comes to the final decision india was so much uh, uh, doubtful or uh, suspicious about the western decisions Indian uh, rhetoric obscured, uh, obscured uh, hard realities from Indian eyes, helping uh, precipitate a traumatic war, a war with China in 1962 at times, and at times exhausting even India's friends. And till 60s, I'm saying early uh, 1961, you can say much more. Uh, uh, so uh, till 1960s, India was very much, uh, uh, it has very moral and idealistic position. But it was challenged, unfortunately, no more um, by the again Asian countries, not the Western countries. And then we realized that what India was thinking about, like the, the Asian uh, unity or Asian community, so it was very difficult. When China, uh, there was an India-China war, border war in 1962, and uh, unfortunately, India uh, lost uh, that war. So, uh, so uh, that uh, gave a lesson to India. Because uh, idealism is, uh, to a certain extent, uh, is, uh, is very good. But politics, as I mentioned earlier, internationalism, it's very pragmatic. It's very much realist. Okay? India and the world. India enthusiasm uh, for participating in, in shaping a regional political security elements is relatively new. After its early disappointments in trying to build Asian unity, as I mentioned earlier, and solidarity in 1950s, India's political emphasis this is turned global and multilateral. So, firstly, it tried in, in Asia, but it didn't uh, uh, work, uh, work out. Then, uh, focused on uh, the more broader uh, uh, grouping, uh, which uh, uh, which have uh, countries not only confined to Asia but across the globe. The presumed leadership, non aligned movement, gave India a stage to articulate its aspirations. The foreign policy assertiveness of India uh, in the in the early Cold War year generated deep suspicion in Western, some Western quarters that India might emerge as a successor of Japan 
Asiatic imperialism. These fears turned out to be exaggerated. Of course, it was uh, exaggerated because uh, Western countries had the uh, had the fear uh, uh, which they faced uh, the rise of Japan and how it turned many countries into uh, 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 how it invaded many Asian countries and turned them into its colony. Korea was one example. So uh, uh, Western. Uh, they thought that maybe India can ban, but these were all exaggerated. India, in history, it never had, uh, the, uh, had this like uh, to invade any country to uh, force its uh, political uh, 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 ideology. It just wanted to have uh, have this uh, cordial relation with like because India believes in like uh, uh, we are a family. We are not far from each other. Yeah. The enduring consequence uh, of uh, subcontinent partition and conflict with China over Tibet and boundary uh, tied down India to dealing with conflicts within its own neighborhood. So the idea of India's Asian community or Asian role was shattered when this uh, the war happened with China and then the Tibet issue dropped out. Then the line um, fled from Tibet and uh, settled in India. Even Today, in spite of all so many uh, criticism, the Lama, Lama still says India is the safest place. I never had the problem in, in, in India. In spite of all the uh, things you can find that, uh, uh, that because it is a developing country, it has a billion people. Uh, so of course the problems will be there. But again, he mentions that it's still better than China. So in spite of China is far ahead in many in, in terms of development, but still uh, freedom is there in India. You can uh, follow whatever the ideology, whatever the uh, religious belief, and uh, say anything like you have the freedom. Although India's third world activism, because we were called as third world, like uh, we were underdeveloped and all these things, uh, like uh, uh, most of the Asian countries, uh, activism mean taking position on all global issues. Do uh, these degenerated into mere positioning against uh, one or uh, both supervisor and the inability to come to aid of friendliness in conflict uh, 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 with their neighbors? Of course, India didn't have any military uh, uh, military uh, capabilities at that period of time to uh, to enter if some uh, some countries are in in in, in uh, 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 conflict because India has its own problem. Uh, and I, I mentioned like this, uh, this uh, uh, the India-China war. Still, when uh, India took bold decision as Indochina in support of Vietnamese intervention in Cambodia or criticizing American war in Vietnam or supporting Sri Lanka, uh, Sri, Sri Lankan government in its fight against LTT, it put New Delhi at odds with great powers as well as back home, other than Soviet Union and uh, uh, ASEAN. Of course, India many times it took uh, some firm decision uh, uh, with its neighbor, but it was not well, very well accepted by the Western countries. In fact, it take, for example, the recent example I'm giving you, many countries are ask, were asking India to take position against Myanmar. Then they said like India realized that Myanmar is its neighbor. If we take America's position, we are just throwing Myanmar away from India. Geographically, we are friend. So why we should uh, uh, just put sanctions and all these things against Myanmar? Someday Myanmar will change uh, and form this uh, democracy. It will take time. It cannot be a one-day affair. And just the Western uh, Western world also uh, took uh, uh, hundreds of years to develop as a, today the modern model democracy. So India was uh, criticized like why it is not uh, uh, taking action against Myanmar and all the uh, other things. Okay. India's views uh, on regional integration. India is today a member of several trans -region, um, uh, regional uh, and sub regional groupings. As India rises, there is a recognition that uh, for its own interest, it needs uh, to consider wider regional as well as global interest. South Asia is a region where, despite existing pan South Asian uh, organizations, SAR, that we uh, say South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, over three decades, it is yet to implement a single all SAR project. The South Asian satellite launch is just a case in point. So, some uh, um, India has its own problem with uh, with Pakistan, and it's a very uh, a member of the SAR. But if we can, uh, that's a, a, a different issue. SAR countries can also come out, just like ASEAN. They have developed, even though they don't have in uh, there are problems with Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos. Uh, there are problems. But still, they have overcome after EU. ASEAN is the single largest, uh, single, uh, I mean, say, strongest grouping 
uh, uh, regional grouping in the in in the world. So uh, SARC can, uh, of course, India has its um, a major role because of its size and, and economy. India has a major role to play, but still, uh, the, the India can also um, uh, invite and uh, bring SARC countries together uh, to work as at least. Uh, if a family, in spite of so uh, differences, whether in political economy, in so many other things. Now, India's views of multi multilateralism, as I mentioned, the India's role in Asia. Uh, so, uh, India's uh, many times it deal with bilateral, but more on, on on multilateral. So, what is a multilateralism? It's like uh, Robert Cohen says, uh, 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 cooperation between uh, uh, more than two countries is multilateralism. So India's view of multilateralism, it has changed over a period of time when it sees that it didn't work out. So that's why I, I previously, uh, previous slides we have discussed, India look, uh, look at a um, uh, much bigger uh, organization, just like, uh, as I said, in that land movement. And multilateralism has also a strong impact on its uh, foreign policy that we will see later. And India, what India followed this uh, non-aligned movement, we will not ally with the Soviet bloc or, 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 or uh, the Western bloc. Today, India is focusing on multi-alignment, uh, minus alliance. Alliance, in international relation, alliance is a very big term and very important in the sense because alliance often uh, always connotes military. So it's a military alliance. So India doesn't want any alliance. India seeks to have a, a strongest partnership, a strongest friendship, but still short of alliance. Because once you enter in the alliance, there is a problem. And there, there is a problem. And that's India wants to grab. For example, South Korea or Japan, they are ally of the United States. Whether they like it or not, when some, sometimes South Korea was forced to join Iraq war, Iraq second war, and Japan was forced to uh, uh, send some uh, uh, funding uh, in the Iraq war and, uh, and also medicine and other things. So India uh, avoids this. Uh, um, but apart from that, as it was like in the Netherlands movement that not to join, today India seeks to have better relationship with every country, including Russia as well as United States. Historical uh, views of India's multilateral. India's enthusiasm uh, for participation in sh and shaping regional political security is relatively new, if you will say. After his disappointments, uh, in try as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the 1950s, India's political impasses is it turned into global and multilateral. The presumed leadership of Nalini gave India a uh, stress to articulate its uh, uh, views. Now, historical views of uh, uh, India's multilateralism. Why it happened? Dilemma over multilateralism. One ask a problem with multilateralism is that we cannot take decision very quickly because you have to take every party in, in uh, 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 interest in mind. So that, that's the problem in multilateralism. Bilaterally, it's a one-to-one -one affair. So that's much more easy. Second, liberal internationalism that happened post 1990s. How much? Uh, how will it work? That was a suspicion in 1990s because India was also a socialist country. Kashmir issue and the West tilting towards Pakistan put India's interest in multilateralism back burner because uh, India was much more focused on internal issues and. Uh, West often, uh, especially United States, often tilted with, uh, with Pakistan. India also uh, tried to do this set up uh, uh, that South Asian, uh, Asian, uh, Asian Treaty Organization and Central Treaty Organization made just like watershed in India's overture of multilateral. So India tried its best. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. Nehru's romanticism with socialism put India against economic multi, uh, multilateralism because liberal inter, uh, internationalism means that you have to open the market. And Nehru was very much uh, India's first prime minister. He was very much uh, uh, influenced by uh, what you say uh, socialism. Okay. The the uh, inward looking uh, put India uh, marginal to the in, uh, dynamics of Asia. So India. Post independent Nehru, for some period of time, he thought like that. Then the China war came, then the India's uh, involvement in Bangladesh independence, the 1971 war. So, India becoming more focusing towards its uh, 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 own area. And India had uh, almost uh, four, four wars with Pakistan. So, focusing on its own uh, 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 country rather than focusing on the multilateral. So, India has a mixed up history, a mixed, a mixed experience uh, with multilateralism. At the height of uh, uh, Cold War, 
So uh, then redefine an unequal relationship between North and South under the frame of G77. So it was a big network. India wanted to be, uh, India always, especially Nehru had the desire to become uh, the leadership and uh, he couldn't uh, see this thing. But India had this in, in mind. So through this network, at least we can counter uh, these, these two blocks. So formation of South SARC with socialism as a defining so there was no real prospect. Today, if we see the economy around the world, at, at the end of the day, so the communist ideology didn't work out. So uh, even, uh, even China or Vietnam, which we see uh, that uh, as a communist country, they are highly capitalist in terms of economy, if you see. If, uh, if we see. So, so and, and the communist uh, uh, ideology also uh, didn't work when you see like uh, any successful uh, uh, country is uh, away from this uh, communist uh, idea. So, or the socialist ideas. So uh, uh, formation of some with socialist idea hardly worked out. Of course, at that period of time, in many countries were like that at least to control the uh, manage people, but in long term, it is not workable. At the height of Cold War, late 90s, uh, uh, you can see uh, when the Cold War is about, uh, 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 was about to end, India's, uh, especially in post 1985, 86, India started feel, uh, feeling this uh, economic crisis. Then a success of regional organizations supplemented by its own economy reform made India to rediscover the importance of economic multilateralism. So 1990 was a uh, very, very important period in India's, uh, uh, um, India's foreign policy, especially uh, it opened its market because it faced a crisis, actually. It, uh, so it, its closest friend, Soviet Union, uh, it collapsed and the break of Soviet Union into 15 countries. Russia was in economic crisis. So, so many other things were there. And then uh, India realized that uh, uh, and uh, India was in need of money. What uh, Sri Lanka today is facing, that was India also in 1990. So India has a difficult time and later realized that India cannot uh, rely on this uh, uh, government control and all the socialist idea. India opened its market and then the, uh, uh, invited foreign companies to invest in the country. And recognizing the importance of accessing uh, external finance, India launched its lookist policy and gradually become the active partner of ASEAN. So India was very much confined to this, uh, this NAM grouping and also what, uh, what we say like the, uh, uh, because of its uh, belief in so, uh, uh, socialism, then it, uh, it was close to Soviet Union, but no more Soviet Union and Western countries were also not very willing, much willing. So India started looking towards East and East means like the little tiger, uh, tigers of Asia, like Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and uh, of course, uh, Singapore, Singapore, at that time, Hong Kong was an independent nation, not part of China, uh, but part of uh, British. So Hong Kong, the five, uh, uh, five states, um, India start, uh, started looking toward. Uh, then Chinese Kunming initiated in the early 90s and India's cold response due to China's hidden support of insurgencies in Northeast Asia. That also India was not very much uh, active if uh, whatever the idea or initiative uh, coming from China. With China's more averages, India, and in order to counter China, India's uh, India started its own uh, again. Of course, it not not uh, uh, didn't work out uh, for a long period of time, but it, uh, still again uh, it started like um, uh, unveiling Mekong Ganga Initiative, uh, uh, India along with Myanmar, Cambodia, Thailand, and uh, Vietnam. Uh, Sen uh, sen uh, sensing the importance of uh, economic cooperation by um, by uh, looking at the success of EU and ASEAN, India began to press for uh, greater cooperation within the subcontinent uh, by re-energizing um, uh, re SARC at the end of 1990s, supporting the idea of FTA in the region, but not much success. Of course, India, um, just like India was wary of uh, this uh, uh, trade um, uh, agreement, many uh, small countries, uh, we're also wary of this uh, of, uh, of this uh, trade uh, very, uh, uh, tra uh, uh, trade agreements because they thought that uh, uh, these big countries will uh, uh, will dominate and uh, the local industry uh, will collapse um, uh, because they are developed countries and we uh, we are not so uh, and at the end of the day it will uh, create uh, much more employment so these type of ideas were there I, ASEAN became the principal vehicle for Asia's region. So what India tried, it didn't work out. And in the meantime, ASEAN was working very well because if you see ASEAN, it looks very strong. It is a grouping, but there is no uh, uh, 
consensus you can say in, in many in, in many things uh, for example uh, uh, they have uh, whatever the ha whatever uh, is happening in uh, in Myanmar, but still, uh, Afghan countries will not take any action against Myanmar. So, uh, still, you can say a strong grouping, and which is working very well, and and it's a big market area. So many countries, including the Western countries, they want to uh, uh, have a network or connection with uh, ASEAN. So, uh, in the modern era, we can say that ASEAN is the uh, guiding principle or the principal vehicle of Asia's regionalism. Liberalization and the rise of its economy gave a new thrust to its own economy. And also it's important, which resulted in the signing of FTAs, uh, SEPA, that's the Comprehensive Agreement Partnership Agreement, almost similar to FTA, and uh, with ASEAN countries. So India uh, uh, actually started Lucas policy, but Japan and Korea, uh, they were very poor. So firstly, it started uh, working with Singapore. And then uh, again, uh, it, uh, it, it expanded to much more like uh, inviting uh, invite in Japan and Korea also, uh, uh, not inviting, including Japan and Korea in its Lucas policy. As is, uh, it, it expanded the ambit of Lucas geographically and politically. Australia, which is very far, but India said it is part of Indo-Pacific. So uh, Australia is also uh, can be included. So India in its Lucas policy. So India started uh, expanding its uh, networking um, in the whole Indo-Pacific. <coughs> Sorry, with with the change of world dynamics in the uh, in post 1990s, multilateralism and regional security cooperation um, uh, emerged at the top of Indian foreign policy. So you can see what uh, see India wa had a mix up of. Uh, uh, a mixed uh, history of uh, India's experience with multilateralism, but again, multilateralism started uh, coming back in the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Indian uh, in the book of Indian foreign policy. Not to be left behind, India vigorously started its campaign, and with uh, uh, covert support of Japan and a strong support from uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Singapore. ASEAN invited India in its first East Asian uh, summit, even though China strongly opposed it. China wanted that ASEAN should be controlled, uh, should be only connected with uh, China. But, and they realized that India with its big, huge market and also has its historical relation with uh, many countries in Southeast Asia, in, in China wanted uh, uh, that India should not be included in this grouping. But, Japan and uh, Sing Vietnam, Singapore, they were very much uh, strongly in support of India and finding uh, Indonesia, uh, um, finding India joined this uh, East Asian Summit group. So nowadays you can see, um, let's say ASEAN plus three plus three. ASEAN plus three is Korea, Japan, and China. And again, uh, plus three, Australia, New Zealand, and India. So ASEAN hasn't been expanded because still they are the, the, the found, uh, founding members, but they have expanded in, in terms of uh, plus and plus. So plus three, first to China, Japan, Korea, and then third, uh, three, India, Australia, and New Zealand. Sensing the economic importance uh, by looking uh, debates over, over uh, um, uh, on India's regional idea of a uh, formation Asian bloc um, you can say in the post decolonization and with different views, uh, supremely suspicious fear of new colonialism. So there was always a fear because most of the Asian countries they they, were, they had the very bad experience of uh, colonialism, and still we say in in, in, in our countries uh, in Asia mostly uh, some, when we find that the poly, Western uh, some of the policies of Western uh, countries are not good for Asia, they say that still they have this colonial hangover or neo colonialism mindset. Is still, is still there. So they still want to control. So that type of idea was still uh, there and, uh, and uh, was there and still persists in, in many of the Asian countries. Independent India must remain at the And what was the idea of like uh, when India was ruled by British? So British also had the idea that the India should remain at the center of any Western strategy securing Asia because it's a huge track of lands, huge territory. Through Asia, through India, we want to control the whole Asia. So India should not be, even that's what uh, Churchill said, uh, British Prime Minister, India should not get independence. And we cannot leave India because through India, we want to control the whole Asia. So that was an idea. That's a colonial uh, mindset idea. 
then uh, post independence uh, things uh, changed as i mentioned the emergence of india's uh, realist school uh, rejecting the pacifist views and focusing on state security because uh, uh, we have discussed india all uh, had this uh, idealist views but generally in, in international politics idealism uh, is uh, work for some period of time but sometimes when you see uh, countries like uh, uh, russia and many other countries that you you you, you find or china uh, you find that uh, sometimes ISIL address doesn't work. Multilateral approach uh, in form, the form of regional council to undermine uh, under security. And uh, you see in, in India, China, still they have, we have this love-hate relations uh, under the small of Tibet issue and finding no cope, uh, uh, finding to cope with the new situation policy by simultaneous engagement and incontinuity due to border issue. And uh, recently there have been so much uh, frictions uh, between India and China and uh, that's uh, that's also uh, uh, India is started looking towards much more realist po uh, uh, policies. A new chapter in India foreign policy with the starting of strategic relations with Moscow and implicitly supporting Vietnam and Cambodia. Bad experience. Why India changed from idealism to realism? So bad experience uh, demands change and good uh, support sustain. So in the, uh, the idealism which India was uh, um, advocating, it didn't work out uh, for India uh, and uh, the experience with uh, the war in China. Transforming uh, from the uh, idea uh, of leading to the area, uh, idea of emulating. So uh, Nehru also had the idea of like, he wanted to lead the Asian bloc, but it didn't work out because in, uh, in order to lead uh, uh, the, uh, in, in any bloc, the country has to be very much stronger in terms of economy, at least, and all, if possible, also in terms of uh, uh, security. So India was on, on, already uh, struggling in its own um, uh, economic and, uh, uh, issues. So how it will lead to uh, 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 other countries? So India started looking towards like how these countries, the Asian tigers, they have changed. So India started looking toward those countries and try to uh, trying to emulate the ideas of economic development, changing the shape of socialist mixed protected economy to capitalist mixed protected economy. Now, being uh, one of the uh, one of the final members of NAM in the Nanaland movement, which was uh, at the core of uh, its foreign policy uh, till the 80s, India uh, and is still there, though it is losing its shine. India was uh, strongly against any alliance uh, and more against the US. Of course, like uh, as I mentioned earlier, India and still India has its uh, uh, very defined foreign policy. We will uh, uh, love to have any um, sort of relationship with any country, uh, closest relationship, closest friendship, partnership, but again, no alliance. Because alliance always means alliance, uh, meaning is friendship and enmity. So the moment you have alliance with any country, that means this is pointed towards some country that uh, there is an enemy. So India wants to avoid this, this thing. Why not? It, it, to maintain its own state's economy. And to be frank, today we see some of the things that uh, the present Indian foreign policy, they are also uh, reaping the benefits of NAM. So we are also negotiating with uh, Russia and also we were talking, uh, negotiating with U United States. So India always wanted to have uh, its own autonomy in, in, in its foreign policy or a, a, any policy. Uh, why a, b, b, a, India opposed US? Because the US alliance included India's adversary, Pakistan. So NAM was a code word for India, uh, in the, uh, for independent foreign policy. Unfolding structural changes in the world politics and Asian balance of power, India US came uh, close at the starting of, uh, uh, of uh, 21st century under Bush administration, uh, Bush Manmohan Singh administration and joint coalition operation in tsunami and military framework, the agreement, etc. cetera, that, and that took place. So. Uh, 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 when uh, the tsunami came in, uh, in Asia in Asian region uh, and uh, so many th uh, million thousands and thousands of people died, India uh, joined uh, not uh, with uh, many, uh, many Asian countries, not only supporting its own people but also the neighboring countries. However, both uh, uh, they realized that India, not only Manmohan Singh and Bush, uh, both uh, were not in favor of antagonizing China. Uh, find deeper bilateral cooperation uh, and then uh, containment of China. So the way China is uh, behaving in the region 
they still found that because a lot of things are, uh, uh, especially corporate com companies, they are dependent on China in terms of manufacturing, and in this is slowly progressing, but it will take time. So instead of like um, uh, antagonizing, they said like uh, to have bilateral security cooperation. Two proposition of this relationship can be taken from Indian perspective to emerge as an indispensable element in Asian balance of power, given its history and location. Strategically, cooperation with the US might immensely strengthen India's future option because US is very much advanced in, uh, in, in, in many uh, fields and India can uh, uh, immensely uh, benefit from, uh, from those technologies and, uh, and other things. Now, India and uh, uh, SARC, uh, you can South Asia. The term South Asia is a very recent origin. It came in, in, into its use in 1960s. South Asia, uh, South Asia basically described physically and culturally uh, contiguous countries like Afghanistan, Bangladesh, uh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. We have almost similar culture, if you, you find it, and phys uh, similar physical appearance. You will find when I was in foreign country, many times people get confused, like uh, uh, people from uh, Sri Lanka uh, and, uh, and uh, India. Oh, you are from India? And sometimes people say, oh, I met my uh, last week Sri Lanka friend. You are also from which part of Sri Lanka? I used to say, no, I'm from India. Oh, you all look same. It's just like when we go outside and especially in East Asia, we get confused, especially if you see them physical appearance, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, and probably uh, Taiwan, uh, of course, Taiwan and um, because they have the Mongolite uh, race. So, uh, and uh, also um, not only China, Japan, Korea, but also uh, Mongolia. So very uh, uh, communities. So um, that was, uh, it was termed as like the South Asian region. India with the East, we have seen the SARC. Uh, now East, India has taken a deeper interest in East Asia over the last decades um, uh, as it tries to, uh, to define its new global role. Although India's engagement with East Asia uh, dates back to thousands of years, as I mentioned, like uh, we have the connection. Historically, we, we see the relationship the very, very much connected. Of course, uh, Buddhism was uh, one factor and uh, uh, much of its development, but in real terms, that was all intangibilities. In real terms, tangible, I am saying either in the economic aspect or in the security aspect or in the uh, political diplomacy uh, aspect, much of the development in the realm of business and strategic relations developed in the post 90s to look uh, its, uh, to project itself as the regional power uh, when it opened its market and launched its locust policy because India was also a very close country in terms of economy. Under this policy, it initiated several uh, uh, economic and commercial ties and also enhanced security partnership with like-minded countries who are concerned with the increasing influence of China in the region. In the early years, uh, the Lucas policy was primarily focused on the association of Southeast Asian nation. However, India, as I uh, discussed earlier, it expanded to geogra its uh, geographic domain of its uh, policy to include Korea, Japan, China, and Australia. So India's Lucas policy expanded and later further expanded uh, that uh, that uh, uh, it can uh, uh, learn and it can take uh, 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 foreign investment from these countries in India. Since last decade, uh, security has become a major part of uh, India's Lucas policy, wherein it concluded a bilateral defense cooperation agreement with Singapore in 2003, marking the first substantive explicit uh, security agreement in the region. Later, it also started a wide range of military cooperation and military exercises with number of countries in the region. So uh, earlier it was Lucist policy. Now it has changed to Actist policy. The Lucist policy was more focused on economy. Actist policy, actually, it is strategic in the sense that it is not focusing on only on the economy, but also security aspect is there. As the regional balance um, uh, is moving from the Western Hemisphere, to, to Asia, Asia, Asia Pacific region, wherein the rise of China and the US uh, pivot to Asia have become uh, a central piece uh, of debate in the foreign policy of several countries. Uh, New Delhi has also crafted its, uh, its policy to stay abreast of the rapid uh, development in, 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 the, in, the, in the region. From, uh, as I mentioned earlier, from Lucas to Actist. In 2014, it, uh, India recrafted it, uh, the Lucas policy to Actist. Uh, act poli uh, East policy, wherein it has sought to actively engage the Asian from both 
perspective. So it is not only India's concern. There are many other uh, many countries which are concerned with the rise of China. The rise of China is always welcome, but the way it is behaving with that uh, has um, uh, uh, that has put many uh, many countries in, uh, in doubts whether it will be peaceful of China or something else. Because often China says peaceful life with China, but it is not like that. Whether you see like uh, uh, in the region, especially South uh, South China Sea, where uh, many countries are in uh, are in uh, uh, territory uh, in, in disputes uh, with, with China, the size of China and its assertive behavior has posed a new challenge to whole world and Asia in particular, starting from India uh, and ending at Japan. All uh, dynasty. Uh, Last uh, uh, China has the idea of like uh, uh, it is at the center of the uh, world and it has civilized the world. China often uh, it says that it doesn't believe in those things, but it often works like that. So China wants to control, and it sees that because one aspect is also the China huge population. Why it is acting like that? So it has to take care of its population, and for population it needs energy, and most of the energies are reserved in the. In, in, a, in the bed of mother Earth. if we it captures this part or it, it uh, uh, holds this part of land of course it will help its country but every country has its own uh, wants to have the share of uh, the, the resources of mother earth so china cannot claim the whole uh, this area is owned only from the uh, historical perspective if we if, if, if people think like that then india can also claim that uh, afghanistan will also be in history Historical terms were part of India, used to be part of India, uh, British India, and uh, uh, Bangladesh was also like that. But we one has to accept the uh, ground reality. These are independent countries, and they have their own uh, uh, interest. Okay, China. Uh, many many of the, uh, these countries uh, in Asian region share New Delhi's concern about China's growing assertiveness, including ASEAN countries. That's why when China was opposing India's entry into ASEAN. Indonesia, Vietnam, these countries, Japan, these countries you know, working very, uh, work very hardly to include India in ASEAN plus three plus three grouping, because they realize that future in future China will not be so much peaceful that uh, it, it it is uh, saying and it will handle China because of its huge population, huge market, cheap manufacturing, so many other things. So and these countries will be dwarfed by the Chinese um, uh, influence. One of the best examples is uh, taking the APEC summit where the, for the first time APEC's 25 is, uh, years history leaders failed to uh, agree on economy because uh, many countries uh, uh, until now people were not criticizing China but in in, 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 in this APEC summit people were uh, very up and they wanted to uh, issue this but finally they failed so it was not like China, uh, what China wanted it uh, it would work out. So finally, they said, and there will not be a final, uh, final, uh, fi um, final reporting, and there was no uh, final uh, communication. China's factors in uh, India's act uh, uh, strategy. If you, uh, 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 China's one bit uh, uh, viewed as deep uh, trap diplomacy, and many countries are going against it. So uh, if you see. China's uh, loans to many countries in the world, it has turned to debt diplomacy. And China's loans are very expensive. Uh, if you see compared with uh, World Bank on uh, World Bank or Asian Development Bank, or even for, uh, forget uh, ignore this uh, multilateral institution, even countries like uh, many countries, uh, like, for example, Japan or India, their interest rates are very low compared to Chinese uh, um, uh, interest on the, uh, on the loan that it provides so you see the country like uh, china's uh, how it is working montenegro djibouti kyrgyzstan uh, all uh, uh, or african uh, papua new guinea Samoa, uh, pakistan maldives laos Fiji. and china also invest in, in those part uh, where uh, the return is uh, it is predicted that the return will be uh, will not be easy so someone invest one billion dollar and if you cannot return, then China asks that we will control this part of the land for 99 years or 80 years or 70 years, something like that. 
So it's a kind of that, and people get um, uh, trapped in this um, uh, Chinese uh, debt trap diplomacy. Chinese economic inducement is viewed as seeking to buy influence. Or some countries, for example, uh, Cambodia or Myanmar, China, uh, uh, give uh, poor money that so that they don't say or don't criticize China. So um, the recent electoral results in Malaysia and Maldives have shown that people are against uh, Chinese and debt trap and diplomacy. Instead of uh, debt trap diplomacy, one built one road. It should be MR, MR to one belt, one road. Many belts, many roads is better to China's one belt, one road, which is often working as problematic for many countries in the region and beyond. So China, uh, what China was uh, projecting in since 2015, uh, 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 16, 17, one belt, one road. So uh, people realize it is not uh, 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 China is supporting countries. China, actually, many countries are getting trapped in this um, uh, one belt, one road, uh, 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 bank loans, uh, uh, bank loans, uh, and um, they are unable to return. So China is uh, uh, working in a very, in a very different way where it is trying to have uh, this territory plan for this particular period of time. India, along with Japan, has launched Asia-Africa corridor. So, relation with Africa, same experience colonization. But in terms of money, India is not uh, is that uh, that much uh, 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 strong. So Japan has entered. Japan doesn't have much more relation in uh, uh, historical relation with uh, African countries. So India and Japan they join together, one with historical linkages and one with the uh, uh, financial linkages. So and uh, they are working on this Asia Africa corridor. This is a plan to create a free and open uh, Pacific region by focusing on ancient sea routes and creating new sea, uh, sea corridors uh, that will uh, link the African continent with India and countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, Southeast Asia. So uh, many countries were, uh, are working, uh, some of the projects that were India uh, initiated and then the funding is coming both from Japan and India. The project, the stakeholders hope the sea corridors will be the low cost and have less carbon footprint when compared to land corridors. And one uh, uh, focus is always that low cost. Japanese alone, if you see, um, one of the, I'm not saying cheapest, but one of the cheapest in the world, because Japanese are wary of China, also Japan, and they realize since in the, uh, uh, much more earlier, Shinjo Abe, when he became the prime minister in Japan, he realized that we have to change. Uh, uh, the, uh, the foreign policy and since then China started uh, Japan started moving uh, in uh, asking uh, uh, inducing its own companies to move away from China and invest in other Asian countries like Vietnam India Sri Lanka so many other countries where you can have the market as well as the cheap labor so opportunities are also there because staying in China for a longer period of time is uh, not going to work for a certain period of time of course uh, you can get the benefit but uh, in long term, it is it will be very difficult. Moreover, India has recently uh, tried to galvanize the relationship, uh, share difference over uh, each other's expectations and development. Of course, India has its own issue with uh, uh, many ASEAN countries because uh, some countries, uh, what happened like, uh, for example, Koreans and Japanese companies, they manufacture in ASEAN and ASEAN and India, has, they have this free trade agreement. So India cannot put tax. So these countries sometimes they don't come to India and invest or manufacture. They just uh, manufacture uh, their products in ASEAN countries, and without tax, they uh, they, uh, they they jump uh, they uh, throw all their products in uh, in India. And of course, uh, India or even Southeast Asia, Asian people, we are very much price sensitive. So at the end of the day, we are getting benefit, but in the larger uh, terms, a country is not getting benefit. So, because the companies are not coming to India, because company come, if they come, they, and these companies come to India, of course, it will generate uh, um, employment also. India's economic force is, is uh, so that's one issue India has with um, uh, some of the ASEAN countries, but already signed the agreement that India can't do much. India's economic focus uh, to, uh, is not um, in tune with other regional powers, which uh, view ASEAN as an important for their exports um, and investment. So, 
in short term of course india has its own issue but india also has to um, uh, develop its own market in the sense that uh, india can also um, uh, these country, companies can uh, manufacture in india and then re export to many other countries and india also has to uh, present itself like the most uh, suitable destination where the uh, uh, companies don't hesitate we can say that india has huge market but the companies uh, uh, consider uh, so many things like it's not only the market or the cheap level so many other things are there bureaucracy and other things are there tax systems is there okay. india's uh, india helped to make since january 22 is like india's uh, when prime minister Modi came to power his main focus was to uh, first neighborhood policy so uh, in fact uh, modi and uh, prime minister, uh, uh, former prime minister uh, of japan shinzo abe they were very close friend once upon a time it was said that uh, modi uh, first uh, foreign visit will be uh, japan but he opted for bhutan because india uh, he, he mentioned that my neighbors are very much uh, uh, firstly my neighbors and then little far neighbors so japan is as important it, uh, but still even the bhutan in terms of economy or other uh, things if people will say that it's not very much a uh, big country but we can change uh, friends we cannot change neighbors we have to live with our neighbors whether we like it or not so india's foreign policy was firstly focused on neighbors so uh, since january and then recently if we see uh, this economic crisis in sri lanka that what happened that uh, and how china played uh, dubious role uh economic crisis india has extended almost like a uh, 3 billion dollar uh, uh, to, to sri lanka india uh, currency swap credit lines for uh, essences and loan uh, means that have and uh, uh, have kept sri lanka afloat sri lankan um, you people know much uh, more than me like uh, what was the economic situation just like uh, months ago it was a very different time so and um, new delhi has also helped sri lanka to defer repayments of loans totaling 1 billion under the asian clinic union so it's not forcing that you have to pay money and you firstly settle your own economy own country and then things will uh, uh, we will see so firstly uh, manage your country that's much more because if any country collapse in the region it is not in the benefit of india because at the end of the day it also hurts india also so if the neighbor is rising india is also rising if the neighbor is not rising india is also not rising so it's like it's a, a, a mutual interest is there india also supplied uh, oil uh, via uh, uh, thousands of uh, metric tons uh, and uh, unfortunately some of the policies in sri lanka like uh, organic uh, previous government in sri lanka the uh, organic farming of course it uh, uh, it also uh, um uh, the economic crisis was catalyzed by one of uh, by these things so many things were because uh, covid was also one factor because uh, sri lanka's economy is also hugely dependent on to, uh, tourism and uh, because of uh, covid for almost 3 years tourists were not coming and then this uh, in between this this uh, organic uh, agriculture drive so many things were there so and then the bad loans and the high interest uh, from china so all it was not a one factor so many factors were there and they realized that it's still india thought that it's time for uh, india to help us to its neighbors then uh, during the covid time unlike uh, many western countries when uh, firstly uh, uh, us and uh, the uh, european uh, union uh, european countries they focused on their own people firstly pfizer and other um, uh, um, uh, other um, 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 uh, medicine uh, vaccines no firstly uh, we will vaccinate our own people and then we will uh, if we uh, uh, we have some more extra vaccines then we will uh, uh, give to uh, other countries india's idea was that no i we will uh, uh, help our own people as well as we will help their people also because if someone dies and because if the virus is spreading around the world if someone is dying uh, dying in sri lanka or in uh, nepal or even in india it is not that it is only india is getting hurt it's a, 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 all the countries will get hurt so and then what is the neighborhood policy india's idea is that so india uh, thought like is uh, to help uh, others as well as to uh, our own people the first, so india sent first batch of humanitarian aid um, uh, which was dispatched to neighboring countries uh, including 
Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, Bhutan, and um, the countries. India has always been a first responder to any crisis in the region and has always extended a helping hand. Even recently, just a few, few days ago, Indian Foreign Minister S. J. Sankar, he said that we have to uh, support uh, our neighbor, especially Sri Lanka. Like uh, it has its own crisis, and it will. We believe that Sri Lanka will uh, overcome this crisis. Every country faced this. India also faced this uh, economic crisis 1990s, but it overcame. And so uh, many uh, uh, people in India believe that it's yes, yes, uh, difficult times in Sri Lanka, but any uh, problem is not uh, for infinite time. It it uh, bad times and good times we can say. India delivered half uh, half million doses of COVID vaccines and uh, uh, 1.6 million tons of uh, aid to Kabul uh, through, through the World Organization. So it has helped uh, to support. Even after uh, when uh, when Western countries left uh, Afghanistan and um, of course uh, uh, Taliban captured Afghanistan and so many other things were there. And when people poor people were uh, uh, were facing so much uh, poverty, food problem, and all these things. India again supplied uh, more medicine and food grains to uh, um, uh, to Afghanistan. So, it, in spite of like we don't agree with this political ideology and all this, what Taliban uh, is doing, but what is the uh, uh, what is the fault of uh, common people? Because not necessarily all all people in Afghanistan they support Taliban, but like because of, if we say that we will not talk with this country, that means that we are uh, indirectly we are going to kill this uh, these people. So India uh, believe that each uh, every human being as much as possible uh, should be saved in any part of the world. And of course, India is not as powerful uh, uh, in terms of uh, logistics in, in U.S. Or, uh, or many other countries, but it tries its best to uh, support uh, uh, countries and especially its neighborhood. In, uh, New Delhi also has placed uh, uh, has placed um, fifty thousand tons of wheat to Afghanistan, India, uh, like and it continuously it is working on that. In fact, India is still uh, supplying more uh, more oil to uh, to, uh, to Sri Lanka. Uh, even some uh, policymakers say that in, it will be a risky. I mean, they say like we can take that risk. Firstly, we have to save our neighbors. So as there are common interests of mutual benefits as well as common concerns owing to the rise of China, both India and Asian countries have to work together for a, from a, a long-term perspective. So, so, and each country has its own uh, uh, reasons uh, uh, that uh, they, they, uh, that with China, that uh, whether it's territorial dispute or the economy, uh, or huge economic influence, trade deficit with China, so many other things are there. Although earlier interest of India was mostly confined to its um, regional influence, it has started to uh, uh, to look beyond. Sorry, uh, what is it? To look beyond it, uh, not only to express its growing nature, but also to counter China's influence in the region. And India has its own region also. India doesn't want China to enter in this part, uh, well, especially in the Indian Ocean and other things, because the way China uh, is working in with many countries, uh, India realized that it will be a problem, uh, a big challenge. India needs to make deeper commitment to Asian countries. That's also for like India is a big country. So it cannot be like um, um, ignored. It has its own responsibilities also. India is not, uh, and in spite of uh, uh, so much differences, people still say that India is not seen as threat, unlike China, which is viewed by anxiety, uh, with anxiety by many countries. However, economic strategy profile in the region in order to come a viable option um, a viable option of trade and mutual benefit compared to China, which dominate uh, in exports with Asian countries. India needs to focus on more effective deliveries of projects, and it is already committed to, uh, to in order to get support from Asian countries. India's, of course, like India, uh, uh, what it is doing in the home country, it also has to change, and also with the neighboring countries, it has to deliver in time. Chinese, in, in that aspect, they are delivering in time. So India has to uh, work on that aspect. If uh, India can also, not only the Asia uh, Africa corridor, India, uh, of course, Asia means the whole uh, uh, countries of uh, in the whole, uh, all countries in the region. So even in the neighboring countries, India and um, uh, like-minded countries like Japan and Korea uh, can join together and uh, work um, uh, uh, with its uh, with neighbor to provide uh, infrastructure and other, other, other things. Both India and many Asian countries have historical and cultural linkages, and hence both need to reinvigorate these bondings.
So we have the cultural needs. As I mentioned that internationalism, there are two elements, tangible and intangible. Intangible, of course, we have all. What we have, like in, even China or any other Western countries, they don't have. Like we have the Buddhist linkages, we have the historical, uh, so many other similarities, uh, cultural similarities are there. But apart from those historical cultural linkages, we have to find out these tangibilities that we can deliver in terms of economy, finance, uh, security, and the aspect. India should uh, also uh, offer a scholarship to Asian students to uh, premium engineering, medical, and management institutions in order to boost people from, uh, uh, to people contact. Who will be the ambassadors of uh, other countries? Not only the official amb ambassador are saying, they are only political ambassadors. But a common people, when we join together, when we and me and you as uh, uh, Sri Lankans, when we, uh, we have good, we will be the representative or the ambassadors of our country. When, uh, if you have a good uh, um, impression or good relation with me, then suddenly you have an image of oh, Indian people are like, uh, same and uh, vice versa, same it goes with me also, if I have a good uh, image or, uh, with my uh, Sri Lankan people. Of course, like, oh, Sri Lanka uh, are uh, really great people. So it's the people to people contact is very much important. India has some of its good institutions, like for example, Indian Institute of Technology or IIT or Indian Institute of Management. And India should su support these countries uh, that uh, students. So even if, if possible, give as much a scholarship as possible. Of course, India is offering a scholarship, uh, no doubt uh, to South countries and even Afghanistan, but it, it may increase the number of scholarships so that many countries, uh, many, many people from these countries, especially in neighboring countries, they come to here and study. And to, tomorrow, they will become the ambassadors of uh, this uh, uh, Asian community. They will become the ambassadors of India because they will go back to their home country. They say, no, it's a great place. You come visit, and then India, uh, the relationship uh, between two, this, uh, these two countries are, will further strengthen. India and Asian countries have a special, a special role to play in reconciling, fusing, and amalgamating these different processes. They stand between China on one side and US on the other side, ge geopolitically. So I'm not saying these countries are a problem, but every country has its own interest. U.S. has its own uh, uh, geopolitical interest and China. Unlike them, India doesn't have any geopolitical uh, big interest. India only wants that we, we uh, live peacefully without any uh, uh, problem. That uh, it's a very idealistic term, but like the thing is that's uh, Indian, uh, India's idea. Uh, they, in uh, India's, if you see the relations with neighboring countries, India has a deep cultural, economic, diplomatic links uh, to both. They do not threaten each other, India. They, in, uh, we, we are not threatening each other. We are going to grab your land or your, uh, your country or uh, uh, we give you money. And then after that, you have to follow. India doesn't believe in these things. So they, and uh, even neighboring countries, the small countries, they don't they think like that. So in, for example, take uh, ASEAN and India. We have differences when it comes to FP and other things. But still, it's not like that we don't, uh, you threat us or we threat you. It's not like that. They do not threaten each other. India is not regarded as a threat to Asian countries. As I mentioned, in this sense, uh, they form what the political scientist uh, Carl Deutsch uh, referred to as security community, a relationship in which there is no fear of war. So we have to have a relationship like, uh, for example, NATO, it's a military alliance. In Asia should have a community, security community, where there is no fear of war. NATO was built to counter Soviet Union, like influence of uh, expansion of communism and all the things. But Asia should have this own uh, community, uh, which, uh, which amalgamates the idea of economy, security, diplomacy, and all these things. But there is no fear of war. Someday the war will take place. These security communities uh, could be a force for greater Asian integration in the years and decades ahead. So of course, uh, when things work out, these are all um, um, very good ideas, how long it will take. Uh, I hope uh, in this uh, uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 years, it will take place. But if it will be a great force, uh, not only in Asia, uh, it will be a great force in the whole uh, world that uh, Asian integration is taking place. India believes in Vasudev Kundagambara, uh, you can say a Sanskrit phrase from Upanishad, which means the world is one family. We don't consider this country or that country. These all are our family members. Like uh, whether it's uh, uh, even we consider United States our family member or even Russia. So we don't consider uh, the idea of this uh, world family is is in the Indian DNA. Like uh, 
and that's what uh, uh, we think that we should uh, come together and and and, jo and join together okay thank you good evening ladies and gentlemen it's my pleasure to leave with a vote of thanks on behalf of the students of the short course on cultural linkages towards an asian ideology first i would like to thank our lecturer professor raj rahul for sharing his time and knowledge with us and for delivering today's lecture amidst his busy schedule. Sir, we are blessed to have you contribute to this course. Next, I wish to thank Dr. Hemant Premaratna and other staff of KDU who have brought these lectures together. Last but not least, I thank all participants from our university for joining us today. Your participation has made this lecture a successful event and I believe it has provided you with an insight into India's role in Asian community. To conclude, let me once more express my gratitude to Professor Raj Rahul for accepting our invitation and delivering today's lecture. Sir, it is an honor to have you with us and your time and efforts are deeply appreciated.